So I'm going to be talking about brain patterns of higher states of consciousness. And talking about higher state, we need a criteria. What makes one state higher than another? And I'd like to propose these three criteria. That the sense of self should be more expanded. The subject-object relationship, how we, the experiencer, interact with the environment should be fundamentally different. And physiological patterns should be distinct. I just want to pause here um, in the chat and to, with some of the other speakers, the question came up, why is all this attention on the brain? Um, isn't it really diminishing uh, the great richness and depth of insights on consciousness from the Eastern traditions? And I'd like to suggest that um, higher states are embodied experience or lived experience are not imagined. So if they're real, what should happen is there should be real distinctly different patterns of physiology. So not to collapse the change in consciousness to a change in brain functioning or DNA or, or neurotransmitter, but rather the physiological measure gives us a, a mirror of what might be going on. So let's start with experience of non-duality during transcendental meditation experience. It's described, transcendental meditation, it's a process of transcending. It's a process in which thoughts become secondary in awareness and the underlying silence, which is always there, become more predominant. And many times in meditation practice, the mind completely settles down, the active thinking, discriminating, experiencing mind settles down. And we get the experience which Arno coined big C consciousness. I asked students um, practicing transcendental meditation to write down experiences of their descriptions of their deepest experiences. And then I did a process of content analysis. And this is what came out of analysis of their experiences. Here we're looking at descriptions of sense of self, how they brought it. What came out were these three themes. It's an experience characterized by the absence, absence of time, absence of space, absence of a body sense. It's a state of awareness, but without ongoing content. Let's place this relative to waking, sleeping, and dreaming. We use this two by two grid. Content, yes, no, sense of self, yes, no. Let's look at the bottom right-hand cell. No content, no sense of self. Now, which state is that? Yeah, that's sleep. English, we say we sleep like a log. We're there, the body's existing, but there's no ongoing experience. How about the upper left? Yes, content, yes, sense of self. It's what we're in right now. There's the light coming from the PowerPoint, the sound from the speakers. There's a feeling of the chair on your body. There's the air in the room. There's all of this content, but there's also a sense of self you're experiencing. You're experiencing this talk from where you are physically. Are you riding your bike and this is on your cell phone? You know, are you sitting in your lab? Where you are mentally, what else is going on in your head? So inner sense of self, subjective experiences combined with content. I'd like to argue that the bottom left, yes content, no sense of self is dreaming. Dreaming is usually characterized by intense, changing, bizarre, illusory dream images. Sense of self, if it's there is very fragile. Now, one exception to this is lucid dreaming. Um, in an earlier paper, uh, 19, late 1990s, we suggest that lucid dreaming is a dream ego, is awake to its content. Because we know when we wake up from a lucid dream, that sense of self, which we have there becomes just a caricature to what we're experiencing now. And that leaves us top right, no content, yes, sense of self. Now, if this was a usual psychological conference, they may maul over it for a minute and then say, hmm, Dr. Travis, it's not possible. I mean, after all, how can you be aware of yourself if you're not aware of the fact of this inward outer dichotomy, that you're the agent having that experience? Now, these objections come from sense of self and waking, which is always there with content. What we've been speaking about 
is this idea of a non-dual experience in the Vedic tradition is called Turiya Chaitana, the fourth. It's a non-dual experience in which just self-awareness is there. This is what Ono called the big C consciousness. It's awareness, it exists, but it's not involved in the activity of waking, sleeping, or dreaming. So we see the description of sense of self is fundamentally different in this state, subject to object dichotomy. In terms of the physiology, we can look at blood flow. During rest, blood flow decreases in all parts of the brain. During stress, blood flow decreases in the front, but it's higher in brainstem areas. During this experience of transcendental consciousness, we see a distinct blood flow pattern. Decreased blood flow in the brainstem, increased blood flow in the front of the brain. Andy Nurberg was speaking about this pattern. This decreased blood flow in the brainstem is what gives rise to the experience of physical rest, of the mind being very settled. But it's not a passive experience. It's highly awake. It's highly vital. In terms of brain function, we need to separate content and wakefulness circuits. Here's the brain looking to the right, the red area in the center is the thalamus. The thalamus has two distinct circuits that go through it. One brings in outside information, eyes, ears, touch, taste. Goes to the thalamus, thalamus sends up into the cortex, it goes back to the thalamus, you get a, a neural loop. This neural loop is a so neural representation of what is out there. There's a second circuit and what that has is the input is wakefulness circuits through the spinal cord. These also create loops from the thalamus to the cortex, but what these loops maintain is wakefulness. Now, usually the mind is filled with thoughts, concerns about what you're doing at home, what you're doing on your holiday, mental chatter, reflecting on just what the information you just had, trying to focus on where you wanna go. The mind is just constantly moving. The process of transcending, we start with a specific thought, a mantra. The mantras used in TM are sounds without meaning. And what they do, they allow the physiology, they allow the mind to begin to become more silent. Thoughts become secondary. And what becomes more primary is this inner wakefulness, silence. It's activity, which is supporting the experience of non-activity. It's activity because it's a lived experience, but it's supporting the experience of non-activity. There's a lot of information here. It takes a 10th of a second for a signal to go from the thalamus up to the cortex and back. And so these circles go up 10 times per second, and that gives rise to the brain waves that we see during this state. Also, because they're being coordinated from the core, from the thalamus, this, the EEG signatures are coherent. It just means that there's a stable phase relationship. Here's an example of TM during tran transcendental meditation practice. Each line is from a different point on the brain. Each column is a second. We can look here. And here we see, let's count it. It's going up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is a nine second per, cycle per second wave. Notice it's the same in all of the leads. That's because the whole brain is settling down to this experience of silence, of wakefulness. There's that independent analysis, guiding of behavior, and so on. Also notice the waves are going up and down together. This is high coherence. And this is a major marker of the state of Turiya Chaitanya. So the state this non-dual experience, transcendental consciousness, experience of the self, fits the criteria for being a stable state of consciousness, unique from waking, sleeping, and dreaming. What happens over time to, due to neuroplasticity is the state can become integrated with ongoing waking, ongoing sleeping, ongoing dreaming. This non-dual state can turn into a stable trait or stable stage. In the Vedic tradition, it's called Turiyati Chaitana, um, or cosmic consciousness. And this is a first stable state of enlightenment in which the self, the individual ego, is now identified with its universal nature. It's outside of the field of change. 
Here's a description uh, from Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in his um, commentary in the Gita. I'll let you read it. Activity continues on the surface. This is a subjective experience that's being described here. Deep within, they no longer exist. The depths of the mind are transformed into the nature of the self. Well, how is this described? This is during sleep. I'll let you read it. Notice the English words they use, there's a continuum there. It's not like I go away and come back. I'm awake waiting for the body to wake up. The individual ego is not thinking and processing. It's not a stream of individual thoughts. There's a continuum, that continuum of awareness, which is that deep silence inside in the previous quote. And this person teaches at the middle school that's associated with Maharshi International University, where I'm based. Notice the concrete image they come up with. It's like the fizzing on top of a soda. It's there and becomes active, something to identify with. This is talking about life in enlightenment. The eyes open, sensory information comes in, thoughts come up, the body acts and so on. When I'm sleeping, it's like the fizzing goes down. And by inference, the soda remains. The soda is just always there. Now, what does this look like in terms of brain functioning? If this is an embodied experience, which it is, what we have here, there are three groups, 11 in each, non-TM control group, people practicing TM but not having this experience, and someone experiencing cosmic consciousness. The top two lines are EEG during sleep. And this is uh, stage three and four sleep, so it's the deepest part of sleep. And what you notice is this low activity here. This is the delta activity where the body is repairing itself. Down here, we have someone sleeping, but with inner wakefulness. The term often used is called witnessing sleep. But we meet, need to be careful because witnessing sounds like an activity, observation, some doing. It's not. Witnessing is more a noun. It's talking about a state of awareness, which has these two mutually exclusive experiences in it, inner wakefulness, even while the body is asleep. And what we notice is the same delta activity, indeed that's the same in people reporting cosmic consciousness and those who are not, but it's more ragged. You can see there's a faster frequency riding on it. We can count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. What you see is that EEG pattern of transcendental consciousness is there along with the EEG pattern of sleep. And this was quantified um, in terms of how much alpha one power is there during stage three and four. It's the deepest part of sleep. It's not light sleep, it's not interrupted sleep. The left white bar is witnessing sleep. The middle light blue is the TM group and the right dark blue is the non-meditating, non-witnessing group. We see significantly more power in this frequency band. Now, how is this possible? So here we have a brain again. The delta of sleep is known to be generated in the cortex. It's layers three, two, three, five, and six. And we just went through this alpha of transcendental consciousness is driven by thalamocortical circuits. What we're seeing is physiologically distinct circuits are being integrated. And this is what happens over time as the brain moves from in to out, in to transcendent, out to activity. What about waking? Here's someone describing her experience. I'll let you read it. I am this being channel underneath. We looked at this 
gave people computer tasks to perform. We compared those people reporting cosmic consciousness, again, the TM control group, not experiencing cosmic consciousness, a non-meditating control group. And we found three EEG variables distinguish the groups. First, broadband frontal coherence. So the front, the part of the brain that's integrating all the activity. Broadband, we see higher coherence in alpha. That's the coherence of just inner being transcending along with beta and gamma because they're doing tasks. We also found significantly more alpha amplitude. They seem to be living life more from inner awareness and not from outer awareness. Gamma fast activity is tied with the attention going out, processing the outside world. We also saw different patterns of brain preparatory response. We gave people a choice and simple paired reaction time task. We looked at what's happening after the first stimulus, which is the um, awakening stimulus, and before the second stimulus, which gives them the information they need to respond. And what we see is increased brain preparatory response from the non-TM to the higher states. This measure, it's actually called contingent negative variation, is known to be associated with reaction time, priming perceptual motor areas. Now look at the choice task. We see an opposite pattern. And now remember, this is looking at a gap where you don't yet have sufficient information to decide if you should act. And we see from the non-meditating subjects, they actually have more brain preparatory response. The task is more engaging. They seem to be more involved. They seem to be more uh, active just because the activity itself is more engaging. We see in the higher states people, they remain balanced. It's almost like higher, um, excuse me, um, martial arts. You're there in the balance point until the person commits themselves and then you respond. We're seeing that in the brain of these people reporting cosmic consciousness. The brain isn't activating, isn't getting the mind and body ready to go until it needs to be there. It's a much more efficient functioning. And this led us to our next series of research, which was, okay, we have this nice marker of people reporting higher states. First, we looked at, does it increase with regular TM practice? That is, as you're contacting the transcendent, do you see this brain integration increasing? And we find it did over three months and six months with college students, with working adults. But next question was, where else do we see it? Is this just a meditation thing or does it have practical significance? We reason successful people should have more of this style of brain functioning. Because when you're successful, you can come up with creative solutions, even under high stress, be able to have that, that vision of the future. So we looked at athletes, 66 athletes involved in world games, national games, Olympics. 33 are in the world-class athletes category and they finish in the top 10 in three seasons of their competitive career. We see higher levels of brain integration compared to controls. Now, again, this is not a meditation study. This is more a success study, uh, something that Hilbert was bringing out. What is the effect? What it, can we see in activity of people having this changed experience within? We looked at top level managers, 50, 25 were top level managers. The company had grown um, over 18 years and the control group were middle level managers. Again, we see higher levels of brain integration and we asked the managers, okay, what's your secret? Nobody said I'm smarter. Nobody said I worked harder. What they all said is we can trust our inner intuition. I think this is a good practical description of what does it mean to be more connected with your inner universal self, the part of you that's whole, that's silent, from which your creative ideas come. If you can be more connected with that, you'll be able to pick up those patterns which would be more successful. And then last, we looked at classical musicians, professional and amateurs. They both have high levels of brain integration. I think this is reflecting the fact that music has a very refined effect 
in its performance. Also, what's found if people play music as a child, their brain is connected differently as an adult. That brings me to the summary. What meditation practices are doing, I think, are bringing different classes of experiences into the realm of scientific investigation. And this is research that should help define what it means to be fully human. What we're doing in our lab is we're now looking at individuals who are continuing to grow in terms of higher states. And we're set silence of the transcendent is not just there as a background, but it reaches out and embraces all ongoing activity. It's a state called unity consciousness. And also I can see looking at the individuals that Jeffrey is helping to transition. It would be, it's really intriguing to me. Will we see this brain pattern of higher states of consciousness in those individuals from beginning to end. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Be happy to address any questions. Awesome, Fred. Thank you so much for a fantastic summary of all of that amazing work. Okay, who's got questions? Again, you can raise your hands and we'll be happy to speak in person or you can type it in and Fred will pick it out of chat. Um, Ulrich, you can see it. Thank you. Ulrich mentions that uh, she experiences this too. It kicked in after a course. I'm glad you brought that up because what we're talking about is not the possession of a specific meditation technique or even the possession of meditation in general. It's part of the human nervous system. Part of the human nervous system be able to tie the deep inner sense of self along with activity. And it's just a matter, from my perspective, of culturing the physiology. Because that state of inner transcendent is there right now. It's right now propelling your thoughts and your feelings. If the nervous system isn't able to maintain that non-changing experience along with the change, you'll just experience the change. And so it's a very real thing. And it'd be nice, Ulrich, if we could see your EEG. We would predict there'd be greater alpha during your delta. Studying pilots, um, yes. Um, I agree, the, the places that we can look to see where is this higher experience, higher human potential being expressed to look in high functioning people across the trades. Look at the, the medical profession during this COVID period, uh, able to handle a huge amount of, of pressure, of uncertainty, of uh, sometimes abused from their patients. You know, how are they able to do it? I've, I've looked at police officers as well. Now this might rise an eyebrow because most people think police officers, you know, they're just power people. They're trying to, trying to push people around or like that. This is part of work I did with the FBI who were interested in helping the wounded warriors, helping the, their officers there who were injured psychologically from the toxic nature of what they were looking at, what they were experiencing. And one of the people there uh, was a sergeant in Colorado and she looked at, for her dissertation, police officers who felt police work was a spiritual calling. And I went and looked at their EEG and their EEG patterns were very similar. They were higher than any of the success that I showed you in, in the athletes, um, in the musicians and managers. They were very similar to those people who've been practicing TM for 20 years or more and experiencing cosmic consciousness. That uh, they, the reason they were able to see that wholeness, even in the midst of police work, I think is because the brain, which is the interface between us and the world was allowing them to perceive the world in that way. Good. Uh, thank you, Gino. Yes, I was very interested in what you were mentioning about a database. Um, I think this would be a very useful outcome of this conference. We have a database of probably 400 people in a range of meditation experiences. And I think getting this knowledge out of the silo of my brain center and more into a larger area where we can begin to appreciate more globally how these experiences are unfolding. So great. I was, reply to you on Facebook. Thank you. Uh, Biosabana, no. 
So um, first, I'm happy to see that they're training synchronous alpha. There is some ideas that gamma is the signature of higher states. And Berman and Stevens, I think, have done the, the critical study on this where they had people blink their eyes during their meditation practice after a non-dual experience. And then they looked around the eye blink. And what they found was theta two and alpha one at that period. And then they randomly took periods, that's just one second periods throughout the whole meditation period. And there they found higher gamma EEG. And what they concluded is gamma may be the procedure rather than the mark of the experience itself. So I'm very happy to, uh, and I like to I'll look up David's work on training biocybernetics because uh, the experience of the transcendent is there. I was just listening to um, a talk between um, Lou Kelly, Locke Kelly, and he was describing something called effortless mindfulness. And that what he did is after practicing mindfulness, he's a mindfulness teacher for decades, he just stopped trying and he found the whole experience was different. And I think this is key because the only way to get to experience of non-activity is a procedure has to be automatic. If you're trying to do anything, any evaluation, any manipulation, what it's doing, it's focusing attention, it's not allowing awareness to just transcend. So to get to this state, I think it's, it's critical, it's, it's imperative that the process be automatic. And how does automaticity grow? It can be in the structure of the meditation technique that is, well, with, that's how TM works, where the attention, where the mind is going, it goes to that inner field of silence, of fullness. It's attractive to the mind. You don't have to push it there. You just have to let go and the mind naturally transcends. You can also make any task that you're doing automatic by overly rehearsing it, by doing it over and over and over and over and over. I think that was Locke Kelly was saying that having been so involved in mindfulness for so long, he could allow it to go by itself in a new experience converge there. Damaged nervous systems. Um, we have looked at trauma, uh, specifically PTSD. Um, we haven't done the, um, the brain measure of that. But what's found is, I've been talking about the brain, it's a bit as though the brain is this disembodied thing. <laughs> the brain is situated in the body. And when we're having this experience of restful alertness in the brain, what's happening is the body inner intelligence, all the feedback mechanisms in the body are waking up. And it's found to be very powerful for allowing the body to remove the effect of trauma, uh, to remove the effect of past experiences. Maybe can I specify my question? Yes, please. Thank you for interrupting me. Um, I'm wondering if you've experienced or witnessed experiences where people had gone into such transcendental states that their nervous system couldn't actually handle the amount of shifts that were happening in their body, the connections that were happening. Um, and if it's like, if there's any study been done around the like electro, the electricity, the electro, actual electrical currents that go through the nervous system and the brain, um, like the, I don't, I guess my question is kind of all over the place, but just the that's level good. of intensity of experience. And if that's ever actually like shut down the system of, of higher consciousness. It's a very sensitive question, Anna. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, it can happen because the experience of the transcendent is very powerful. With transcendental meditation, it's, it's not you creating the experience, you allow the experience to unfold. So what happens is you get, the, the mind opens up, you go to an experience of inner silence, you get as much as you can handle. And then what happens is then the body starts to integrate it. And so then we come out of that experience and again, we go back in. But for instance, people who are on retreats and so they do more than meditate twice a day, they may, may meditate four times a day or longer. There can be some issues with mental stability. 
And so you don't want to practice tr uh, TM when you're out in the world, only when you're under in a retreat where someone is there. And also want to be sure to get lots of physical activity. Because again, these experiences are lived experiences and you have one experience of inner unboundedness, expansion, and then you want to dive into activity. You want to be as focused and active as you can be. And what it's doing, it's bringing that silence in. Now, this said, as someone has had a prolonged experience of the transcendent, and it seems to be destabilizing, what you want to do is very strong um, program of physical activity. You want to have good sleep. You want to have good food. And talk to a meditation teacher in your tradition. 